Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! So they've been flying back to Britain from all over the world. The business secretary, Sajid Javid, is still to arrive from his trip to Australia. But ministers have not been able to say exactly what they're going to do to tackle the crisis in the steel industry that threatens around 40,000 jobs. Following an emergency meeting at number 10 this morning, the Prime Minister said nothing had been ruled out, but then did appear to rule out renationalisation. So how is it all going down on the ground in the steel communities? Our chief correspondent, Alex Thompson, is in Port Talbot tonight. Alex. Not well, in a word, John. Caught in a crisis, David Cameron can be relied usually to roll his sleeves up and call a meeting of Cobra or something like that. What we got perhaps this morning, Cobra Light. As you say, a group of ministers meeting at breakfast time to put something on the table. Well, that was the plan. It didn't materialise. What they got was a good deal of rhetoric, fine words, but nothing more in terms of a concrete plan for restructuring and reselling this stricken plant. It's not just Port Talbot, it is 40,000 steel jobs now in England and Wales at stake. And a Prime Minister this morning offering apparently just words. No renationalisation, no detailed strategy and no money. We were concerned that there was the chance that there could have been an outright closure of Port Talbot and that is why we work very hard with the company to make sure there is a proper sales process and we'll be doing everything we can to encourage people to come forward. But this is a difficult situation. There's no guarantees of success. David Cameron doesn't want renationalisation, but then again, nor do the unions, including an official we met oh, yeah. just back yeah, from Mumbai. Renationalisation isn't viable going forward. We wouldn't want charities and we wouldn't want armed out. There's, it's there's not about that. They did it for the banks. They can do it for you. Short-term measures, see you through the crisis. Short-term measures, yes. That's okay. a different thing and I think that's where people are getting mixed up. Yes, we will need short-term support to get us uh, to be sold. Well, we're not talking about setting up a, a nationalised company here, as it were, as it, as it was in the in the old days, but taking the uh, the industry uh, uh, on in order to allow time for a new buyer to uh, to come forward. Now, the UK government has the resource to do this. Uh, we'll put money on the table, but we don't have the resource on our own to do it. The steam of a complex, perfect storm. Global price slump, high energy levels. This place uses more electricity than Swansea does. Germany cross-subsidises EU anti-pollution laws to protect its industry. The UK doesn't. So Tata bore the full cost of cutting emissions on Furnace 4 here and then faced a £400,000 hike in the business rate. Then the ultimate absurdity. There is no such thing as a free market in steel. Communist China's subsidised global steel dumping has rigged the entire thing. The United States of America took one look at that and slapped a 267% tariff wall to protect their steel industry from cheap imports of Chinese cold rolled steel. And the EU response, months and months of bickering and acrimony to arrive at a 1-3-13% tariff protection for our steel industry. And the British are fighting any increase on that because they say they want to protect their relationship with Beijing. Steelworker Howell Jones now faces losing his beachfront home along with his job. We joined him, his co-worker Scott and his fiance Haley and family for a chat on the beach. Got 20 miles that way, you've got Trostra, but if we go, Trostra go. That's another steel factory. You've got yes. 40 yep. miles that way, you've got Lamwoon. Yeah, if another we go, plant. Do you plan we go? And as, yeah. as well as well, this is 40, so where do we go then to work? As well as yeah. Wales. Yeah. Yeah. So where do we go then to work? As far as jobs right. outside the steel and at least 50 left miles left. in any direction then to get work, can't you? Obviously we've got energy costs in Britain, we're paying a lot more than anywhere else in Europe. Business rates we're paying a lot more, so I think we need help with them off the government. Obviously procurement, I know they've you know deals have gone abroad where we should be using British steel, so I think if we're not helping ourselves a lot, I think, with the government. British Steel is a big, massive part of Patalbert. It's the heart of Patalbert, and you've got to keep bringing in the steel. So as for the government, they've got to step in, they've got to really take drastic action. Howell's lesson from this disaster, we need to get out of Europe. I honestly believe we need to come out of the EU. 
you know, and become our own country once again, you know. Oh, so you think it's an EU problem? Definitely. We, we can't make our own decisions, can we, you know? Just a few miles from that beach this week, 3,000 have been queuing for 750 new jobs at Aston Martin. Demand four times supply, and that is with the steelworks still open. And what of the hapless business minister then, Sajid Javid, former banker, He's been to Australia, accused of being in the wrong place at the wrong time, three days into this crisis, on his way back, possibly coming to Port Talbot tomorrow. But it's emerged he took his daughter with him to make a bit of a jolly of the jaunt to Australia. And that has enraged a number of MPs, not least the MP for Redcar. They know a few, a few things about steel closures there, who called for his resignation. As she put it, he put a holiday jaunt before saving the British steel industry. If he comes here tomorrow, depending on where he goes, he could get an interesting reception. Back to you. Thanks, Alex. Well, there is still intense uncertainty around the future of Tata's UK operations tonight. Our business correspondent, Helia Ebrahimi, is here. She's got more details. Helia, what have you learned? Well, I understand that PwC has been hired as restructuring advisors for Tato. This is a move that could lead to a full-blown administration, but obviously that's still only one potential outcome. Now, it could sound like bad news, but at least there's a process underway. And if you remember, PwC were recently administrators for another steel company in trouble, Carparo, and they managed to sell that business quite successfully. So what are the implications of this for the government? Well, I think it's fair to say tonight there's quite a bit of confusion about what the government's strategy is. There seems to be growing divisions between ministers themselves. There's a faction there that wants to invest money. They think that it's worth investing because it's in the national interest. But I don't think that sentiment is shared across the government because of the open-ended nature of what that cost means to the taxpayer. And tonight we spoke to the parent group, Tata India, and they were telling us that they haven't even heard from the British government when it comes to suggesting uh, potential buyers or a rescue plan. Now, that's not an opinion shared by Downing Street, who told us today that the dialogue has been ongoing. So it's very difficult, Matt, to actually unpick what's been going on behind the scenes. So what does this mean for all the various bits of the Tata business? Um, well, look, let me take you through Tata's business across the UK, because it's quite a big one. Mm -hmm. And you've got about 15,000 people employed in Port Talbot, over 4,000 people are employed. Mm -hmm. Scunthorpe, about 3,000 people are employed. And across the rest of the UK, a further 8,000 people. Now, Scunthorpe itself is a separate sales process, and the potential buyer there is called Graybull Capital, a financial turnaround specialist. I spoke to some people close to that deal tonight, and they said talks are going on constructively. But again, remember, this is a deal that hinges on a government-backed £100 million loan. But they tonight ruled themselves out of buying anything from the Port Talbot plants. And if we move back to Port Talbot, this is the part of the Tata business that's being restructured now by PwC. I think there are buyers out there that could even be a management buyout for the processing plant. What's going to be a much more difficult uphill challenge mm. is what happens to the blast furnaces. Somebody said to me tonight, it's going to be very, very challenging to find a buyer for that because of what we said, those very high energy costs. Ongoing story. Heli Ibrahimi, thanks very much. John? Well, we did ask to speak to the government, but no one was available. So joining us now to discuss this is the Labour MP, Stephen Kinnock, whose Aberavon constituency includes the Port Talbot plant, and the Conservative MP, Chris Philp, who sits on the Treasury Select Committee. Um, you live there part of the time, or much of the time, yes. and I'm wondering, um, did this all just suddenly come up and that was it, or have you had a sense that this needed looking at for some time? No, this crisis has been brewing for a long time, and we've known for several weeks that the 29th of <coughs> March meeting uh, in Mumbai was going to be absolutely critical. I think that's what uh, raises even bigger questions about the shambolic nature of the government's response. This is not something that's come out of the blue. But what's critical now is that the government rolls up its sleeves, gets to work with Tata Steel, makes a plan very clearly around how we're going to get Tata Steel to keep operating whilst we look for a buyer. And the future livelihoods of thousands of people in my constituency uh, rest on this. And I can tell you the sense of anger and frustration is building. 
well, Chris Phil, this is the essence of how Parliament works and how politics work. That you have a committee and you're on it, mm -hmm. and you start saying, hang on a minute, <coughs> Scunthorpe's gone, we, Redka's dead, we'd better look at Port Talbot. Have you been looking at Port Talbot? And if so, what is your solution? What's going to happen? Well, I think, first of all, in terms of what the government has done so far, they've No, put... no, I'm talking about your committee. We'll come to the government in a moment. Your committee, your MPs, we've elected you to look yeah. after business and particularly well, to it... look at steel. What's your plan? Well, it falls under the Biz Committee, not Treasury, but I think the point is, as Stephen said rightly a moment ago, we need to see the government stepping in and working with whether it's the existing management or a potential buyer to provide whatever assistance and guarantees are needed to keep that plant operating in a really difficult global environment. It is very tough. Okay. Steel prices have collapsed. There's huge overcapacity, but that won't last forever. And I think the government should work with, with a buyer or management to keep the plant operating um, while, until market conditions improve. Well, where really where would the Treasury Committee reckon the money could come from in order to do that? Well, I think you've got Our to, pockets. You've got to view it in the round and think about the jobs that would be saved. And, if we, and by the way, if we do lose the UK's steel manufacturing capability, and the Chinese end up with an effective global monopoly, in three or four years' time, they may end up putting up their steel prices and then we'll all be in big trouble. So I think there are, there are compelling strategic as well as, as human, you know, the job losses and economic reasons for trying to keep this plant mm. open. Now, the Prime Minister says he's been working behind the scenes. Presumably you've seen the shadow of his hand moving about <laughs> in <laughs> Aberavon. Uh, Blink and you miss it. What, what's the story? Well, I think there's been lots of talk and very little action. For five years, we've had talk about dealing with Chinese <laughs> dumping. In fact, they've been working against the European Commission's attempts to give dumping re regulations more teeth. Well, but uh, raising uh, tariffs against the Chinese comes with awful penalties. I mean, George Bush did it in America in, uh, back in 2003, and that ended in serious tears. He had to back down. The uh, Chinese threatened every possible thing in the book. We couldn't afford it. It's difficult to imagine a higher penalty than losing 40,000 jobs, though, John. I mean, we're talking now about a strategic steel industry that is hanging by a thread. And the, when you look at the entire supply chain, you're talking about 40,000 jobs. Uh, what's extraordinary to, to think of is that this announcement, which I think is one of the biggest business and economy-related things yeah, in post-war Britain, but I, I want and, to know and what the Sajid think... Javid wasn't even in the country. Well, that's what I want to know. I mean, is there any sign that he's ever been down there? Well, uh, I understand... You're he, the MP, you'd know. Yes, yeah, I, I know that he has been in Port Talbot at least once. He may have been there more times and not told me about it. Um, but do you it, sense it is absolutely pivotal within his department? This is the big thing. It should be, uh, but I don't get a sense of the urgency. I, what, what I found extraordinary is that the Prime Minister has come out with such mixed messages. Well, he says, we don't want nationalisation, but all options are on the table. What does that even mean? Okay, can, can I start by just talking about what the government has done so far? So in the face of this global steel crisis, the government has put £400 million into subsidising their electricity prices, which have been high. That's a 30% electricity price subsidy. Um, they've campaigned vigorously at the European level to introduce tariffs. We've got a 9 to 13% tariff on rebar, and the British government is pushing for a higher tariff, a 30% tariff. Mm -hmm. So there's been real action at the European level. In fact, George Osborne this evening is in Paris talking to his European yeah. colleagues about going further on this tariff I just heard to protect from us against um, cheap Chinese imports. I just heard a sort of gasp, but it's all very well, but Labour's been in Europe for a very long time. What have they done? Well, the, uh, if you look at back at, say, 2011, um, the share of Chinese steel in the British market was minimal, 3-4%. It's now up at around 50-60%. So this is a crisis that's really yeah. come to a head it's in the last crisis, four or five years. Stephen, it, but there's no real sign of Labour really going for go. We had uh, Jeremy Corbyn on last night. I mean, he really had nothing to say in terms of what they were going to do to the government over this. There was no call for anybody's resignation. This is a problem which has been sitting there, smouldering away, and nobody's done anything about it, and bang, suddenly, PwC are in there tonight, and they may well take measures which will result in this business going straight into administration. It's impossible so where to overstate you the importance. We have called for untold debates in the chamber. We've had a Save Our Steel campaign. I went out to Mumbai with the delegation from the brilliant community union that lead on this. So I feel that we have been trying to hold well, the government to the fire. They say they've the done fire. everything they can They've do. been what asleep at the wheel. Well, look, it's a bit of Richard Labour talking about this. 40,000 steel jobs were lost under Labour. That's more than are currently employed in UK steel in total. But look, the government has taken action. I've mentioned the tariffs, I've mentioned the 400 million. Um, we need to, and, and, and the fact that George Osborne this evening is on the case, but we do need to make sure well, that the, the money is available. George Osborne's a bit, bit, bit uh, well disposed towards the Chinese, isn't he? Well, yeah. I mean, we, we've, we are lobbying. The UK government is lobbying. I've got a, a letter in my pocket from the business minister, Anna Subri, confirming to me in writing that we are lobbying 
in Europe for a 30% tariff on rebar, up from 10%. So I've got written evidence that we're pushing the Europeans to go even further. Chris Philp, Stephen Kinnock, thank you both very warmly for coming in. I've been getting away with it all.